when you're suspecting somebody is having a heart attack or any kind of acute coronary syndrome, there's a couple things that we need to do. Now, the overall goal of management when it comes to a person who is having a heart attack is the first thing we want to consider is that we need to stop the infarction process. Somehow we need to stop the infarction process. Now, a couple ways that we do this is first of all, we have to perform a rapid assessment. And not only assess the patient rapidly, we also have to treat the patient rapidly, so we have to perform a rapid treatment. Because you have to remember that when somebody's having a heart attack, this is not something that they're working on for the last couple days or couple hours whenever they've had their symptoms. This has been going on for a very long time. So by the time they start showing symptoms and the time they finally call us, we're going to be way behind the eight ball in many of these cases. So what you want to do is you want to not only rapidly assess the patient to figure out that they're having a heart attack, you want, if you determine that they're having a heart attack, you need to treat them just as quickly and get that treatment regimen started because every minute that we delay the treatment increases the patient mortality. So how do we stop the infarction process? Well, to stop the infarction process, there's a couple things we can do. First of all, we can stop it by medications which is probably the most common way that we try to stop it initially. And if that doesn't work, there's also surgical intervention. Those are the two main ways that they actually stop the infarction process. And surgical intervention could mean a coronary artery bypass graft. It could also mean percutaneous coronary interventions, which is which is still surgical but not quite as invasive as a bypass. A couple things I want to consider that I want everyone to consider whenever we talk about people having a heart attack. This is a pretty big number here. 50% of patients who die do so before reaching the hospital. Now does that mean that it's with the paramedics or with EMS? Not necessarily. What I mean by this is that 50% of people who die do so out of the hospital, outside of the hospital. Very high number with the, with the access to 911, the ambulances, and the, how quickly we can get people to the hospital nowadays. That's still a really high number. Another thing to consider is that sudden cardiac death is most likely to develop during the first four hours of ACS symptom onset. So there is a chance that once symptoms begin and the patient recognizes that symptoms begin, sudden cardiac death most likely will occur within those first four hours. So when we get there, and this has been going on for more than four hours, we have to be really quick on our treatment getting them to the hospital because they could just die on us at any time and to us they seem perfectly fine with a little bit of changes on the monitor. So 50% of the patients who die do so out of hospital and sudden cardiac death is most likely to develop during the first four hours of acute coronary syndrome symptoms. What are some issues with the patients receiving treatment? Well, the number one issue, the biggest issue with patients not receiving treatment is basically patient delay. Patient delay is the biggest issue. Nobody plans on having a heart attack. They just start having a heart attack. And a lot of times when these people have a heart attack, they have no backup plan. They think, I have a meeting to go to. I have to pick somebody up from the store. I have to do this. I have to do that. They think that they have so much stuff to do that they'll get to why they're not feeling well or they'll just kind of muscle right through it or something, not realizing that they're actually having a heart attack. So there are a lot of public programs that are put on usually through uh, university hospitals or hospitals that are associated with universities, public access channels, that kind of stuff that try to talk about these are signs of you having a heart attack. Even Bayer Aspirin has a commercial that says if you feel like you're having a heart attack, call 911 and immediately take an aspirin. What they're trying to do is not only sell their aspirin, but they're also saying if you're having a heart attack, you need to call 911. You don't always live through something like this, and yes, it can happen to you. 
Another issue with receiving treatment is a potential need for early defibrillation. There are crews in the past who, when they've gotten to the scene, defibrillation is not an option because they don't have an AED, so they can't defibrillate the person. If a person is in a pulseless VTAC or a V-fib, you need to, they need defibrillation. That is going to help just as much as uh, pushing hard, pushing fast for chest compressions. Eventually, you need to give them a defibrillation after you do a couple minutes of CPR. Lack of out-of-hospital 12 leads. This right here is not as much of a problem now as it has been in the past because the 12 lead technology has gotten to a point where it is cheap enough to put in all kinds of cardiac monitors that are used in all of the pre-hospital settings across the country. So fortunately, there's not much of a problem with that. And it's not that there is a lack of access to 12 leads in the pre-hospital setting. It is a lack of doing the 12 lead in the pre-hospital setting. That's the biggest issue here. The next one here is lack of notification of the receiving facility. Now some facilities when you re receive, when you get the patient to the hospital, the facility has to do some work to get the thing rolling. So what you want to do is you want to contact the receiving facility as soon as possible, as soon as you get on the road contact them and let them know because a good facility will be waiting for you when you get there they'll be waiting for you in a room they'll be expecting you and you'll go right into a room or in some cases I've even gone directly into cath lab where they're expecting us over there they don't we don't stay around there in the ER for very long now if we just show up at their back door they're not going to have any idea about us coming in and now they have to get the ball rolling and time is tissue and the last thing you want to do is keep increasing that time either up to or past that four hour mark so you want to get them to the hospital quickly and efficiently notify the receiving facility and the last issue with receiving treatment for a heart patient is uh, triaging the patient to the improper facility nowadays there's a lot of facilities out there that are becoming cardiac centers and they're doing interventional cardiology programs and that would actually shorten the time that the patient hits the door of the hospital to when they're put into the cath lab. Now what happens if you take the patient to a cath lab that or take the patient to a hospital that doesn't have a cath lab? Or you take the patient to a hospital that has an interventional cardiology team that's not there yet or that doesn't even have cardiology there? that's going to be a problem because now they're going to have to try to transfer that patient out or do something else. So you have to make sure that following your local protocols or following your local uh, policies, where is the patient supposed to go? The three time intervals of delay. There's three particular time intervals of delay. The biggest delay of a person getting seen and getting treatment is the recognition of the symptoms and the decision to act. That's like call 911. Of all three of these delays, 60 to 70 percent of the delay is this part right here, is the recognition of symptoms and then the decision to act on the symptoms themselves. Like I said, people, they don't plan on something like this and they, well, I'll go after work. I'll have to go in a little while. I, and they don't think about it. People go on vacation. You don't want to go to the hospital on vacation, so I'll just wait till I get home. We'll do something else, and then we'll go see somebody or something. So that is the biggest delay. Out-of-hospital transport. What percentage of people are not transported that have these symptoms? Well, it's actually a very low number. 5% of the delay is patients not being transported to the hospital. Fortunately, that's a very small number because of the training that paramedics and that ambulance crews get that if the person's having a heart attack or a suspected heart attack you have to get them to the hospital. The third delay is arrival to the ER and then the proper treatment. This is only 25 to it's supposed to be a 5, 33 percent of the delay itself. So as you can see here the biggest delay that we have here is Recognition of the symptoms and the decision to act. The problem is that there are some symptoms that are so subtle, patients don't realize they're having a heart attack. And then it's too late. They all of a sudden code, and they just felt like general malaise with a little bit of chest discomfort, maybe some nausea, vomiting, and they never decided to act. 
to how do we prevent this patient recognition and symptoms uh, and the decision to act, this is where that public education comes back into play. They're trying to get the education out there. If you're experiencing these symptoms, you could be having a heart attack. Call 911, go to the hospital. The public education is the biggest obstacle for us when it comes to treating cardiac events. Symptoms of chest discomfort. This is some pretty cool numbers, and I got this out of a book that I have here that uh, I thought this was, these are really good numbers because they paint a better picture of what kind of symptoms that people usually have. Now, half of the people, specifically 54% of the people who have an acute coronary syndrome have typical acute coronary syndrome symptoms, which means half of the people that are having a heart attack are having normal signs of a heart attack. Half of the people who are having a heart attack do not have normal signs and symptoms of a heart attack. And you have to be very careful now because now maybe the nausea, vomiting, feeling like crud person is actually having a heart, a cardiac event, is actually having a heart attack. Also remember, like I've said in the past, electrocardiographic evidence of a heart attack is a late sign. It is not the first thing you'll see. It's one of the last things that you'll see. 43% with acute coronary syndromes had burning or indigestion. 32% had chest aching. 20% had a stabbing chest pain. Now that's a kind of a high number when you think about it because a lot of people say, well, if you have a stabbing pain, it is not a cardiac type chest pain. You can't say that because according to this, 20% of the people who were having a heart attack did have stabbing pain. And here's the last one, 12% of people complaining of an acute coronary syndrome had pleuritic pain. So right there, if you've heard in the past, if somebody has pleuritic pain, or a stabbing pain, they can't be having a heart attack because the heart doesn't work that way or whatever excuse that you heard. Unfortunately, this goes to show right here, it is very possible that people with stabbing chest pains could be having a heart attack. Is it very common? Not as much. But you just don't want to bet your career on that. The American Heart Association, one of their more recent, uh, not their most current, but one of their recent guidelines, actually stated specifically in the books, said, EMS personnel can perform immediate assessment and treatment, MONA, which is the morphine, oxygen, nitro, and aspirin, including initial 12-lead EKG and review for fibrolytic therapy indications and contraindications. Now, what exactly does this tell us? In other words, they're expecting us to have material done, to have this stuff done for them when they get there. Now, I'll say in some systems, they don't want you to use a fibrinolytic eligibility checklist because they have their own, and the doctors and nurses want to do their own. That's perfectly fine. But at the same time, I'll say that they're also expecting us to show up with an EKG. They're expecting us to do an EKG just like they're expecting us to do a blood sugar, just like they're expecting us to do a blood pressure. They're expecting that stuff to be done when we get there. They don't want us to blow all this stuff off. They want us to make sure that we treat the patient and we figure out what's going on with the patient right now. Now, a lot of people in the past have said to me, well, is this going to change my treatment plan? It may change your treatment plan. You still need to perform the proper treatment, including a 12 lead, and if your system dictates, a review for fibrinolytic eligibility. So, in other words, this statement right here was telling in-hospital people that the ambulance is not just another ride to the hospital. So some of the medications that we're going to talk about real quick here, oxygen, antiplatelets, nitrates, analgesics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and we're going to talk briefly about fibrinolytics. I don't get too heavily into the fibrinolytics only because they can get really complicated, and there are certain indications, and then there are certain preferential fibrinolytics based on a physician or a cardiologist, so I don't want to get too crazy with them, but if you hear some of these terms, I want you to realize that they are using a fibrinolytic. 
So the first thing, of course, is oxygen. For years, American Heart has been saying oxygen at four liters per minute is perfectly fine. A lot of EMS crews have been told since they were baby EMTs all the way up through the seasoned veteran, anybody having a heart attack has to have a non-rebreather. Just be aware, the research is moving a little bit. Non-rebreathers are not necessarily indicated for every single person. American Heart for years has been saying a nasal cannula is fine. You're increasing enough of the PO2 inside of the arterioles to help out. But at the same time, if your protocols or if your procedures tell you to put on a non-rebreather, you still have to put on a non-rebreather. Aspirin. We want to make sure that we give the person chewable aspirin because the chewable aspirin will actually get into the system quicker. So make sure that the aspirin is chewable. What it does is it inhibits thromboxane A2, which helps with platelet aggregation. Platelet aggregation usually means this is like attraction of other platelets is what's going on. And what it will do is it will prevent more platelets from adhering to the growing clot, as it were. Now, the disadvantage to giving aspirin, of course, is that you could exacerbate some other bleeding that might be going on as well. Aspirin does not make the clot smaller. It only prevents the clot from getting bigger. So there's a little bit of difference there. If somebody is having a heart attack and you do give them aspirin, there's actually a 30% reduction in mortality when aspirin is given to a person who's having a heart attack. Now, if this person ends up getting fibrinolytics and aspirin, the chances, uh, the reduction in mortality goes up to over 40%. So you get, so you have almost a 50% chance of better surviving if you give the person aspirin. Just make sure it's chewable. If you give the person aspirin that they have to swallow and drink with water, two problems with that. Number one, you give them some ammunition in case they get nauseated. Now they're going to throw up everywhere. The second thing is aspirin that you take in with water that you drink and then it hits your stomach still has to be dissolved before it gets absorbed. Chewable aspirin is broken down first. It's absorbed much faster. Another thing that happens with aspirin is it also helps prevent something called paradoxical procoagulability. This paradoxical procoagulability right here is a condition that occurs that after you give somebody fibrinolytics, what happens is the fibrinolytics free up trapped thrombin, which is part of the clotting cascade. And now that this thrombin is free floating in the system, you can now potentially start redeveloping a clot if the fibrinolytic wears off. So what aspirin will do is it will prevent this clotting activation right here from reinitiating after you give the fibrinolytics. Plavix, also clopidogrel, is another medication that is very similar to aspirin. It prevents ADP binding to receptor platelets, which once again does not prevent the clot or does not create a smaller clot. It doesn't break down the clot. It prevents the clot from getting bigger. This can be uh, administered with or without aspirin. Plavix or clopidogrel is something that is given on a regular basis to people, just like taking a chewable aspirin or something along those lines. It's usually not given in the emergency setting. This is a prescription that somebody is on. Onset is an hour, peak of two hours, a half-life of eight hours. The important thing here, it could be administered without, with or without aspirin. The responsibility of nitroglycerin is to relax the smooth muscles located around the arterioles, or these are the resistance vessels. So it relaxes the precapillary sphincters and the arterioles themselves to enhance collateral circulation. A lot of people have been confused in the past that if you have an artery here that is sclerotic, and there is a problem here in this artery that's, and this is your little sclerotic area right here. Now this artery is preventing blood flow. If a clot starts to develop right here in this artery, 
what will happen is distal to this clot right here, you're going to start to have a buildup of acid. You're going to have a start because you're losing uh, oxygen and nutrients down here, you're going to have a buildup of carbon dioxide because it's a byproduct of aerobic metabolism. And you're also going to have a buildup of lactic acid. Now, during this process right here, your pH is going to start to drop or become more acidic. As your pH in this area of the tissue, distal to the clot, is becoming more acidic, that automatically in this artery causes vasodilation. So there is some vasodilation distal to this artery right here that's going on. So when we give nitroglycerin, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the arter arterioles and arteries and capillaries that are over collaterally that are going around this area. We want them to dilate more than we're trying to get this to dilate. Now, of course, we are trying to affect this area right here that is causing the clot, but we're also really trying to hit this collateral area so that way we can hopefully get more perfusion to the area over here that's ischemic. That's the main idea behind giving nitroglycerin whenever we give it underneath the tongue. When it comes to nitroglycerin, you can usually give it into a, you can give it IV or you can give it sublingual or whatever. American Heart uses a blood pressure of below 90. You cannot give, the, give nitroglycerin. This is a contraindication. If the heart rate is less than 50 or over 100, this is also a contraindication. For right ventricular infarction, a lot of people are saying use cautiously, so you want to be careful with administration. Only because right ventricular infarctions, you already have a smaller muscle in the right ventricle because it's a low pressure system. And if you give nitroglycerin and you dilate all of the arterioles in the body, because that's what you're doing, then it will decrease your preload. If you decrease your preload, you're going to decrease the cardiac output to the lungs, which will decrease the preload into the left ventricle, which will decrease the cardiac output out of the left ventricle. So what could happen is you can give somebody one nitro pill or one squirt of nitro glycerin liquid underneath the tongue, and then their blood pressure crashes and they hit the floor. So some systems are saying don't even give nitroglycerin if there's a right ventricular infarction. Other systems are saying just be really careful with it, but if their blood pressure drops too much, then you need to jump on that. The last contraindication here is the use of phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Now, the phosphodiesterase is for erectile dysfunctions. These are the generic names. Sildenafil Sildenafil is, is Viagra. Varen Vardenafil is Levitra. I think that's how you spell it. And Tadelafil is Cialis. The Viagra and Levitra, if they've taken that within 24 hours, you need to withhold nitroglycerin. The Cialis, if they've taken that within 48 hours, because that's more of an extended release, then you need to be careful with giving that within 48 hours of administration or of them taking it. Some of the precautions you want to consider whenever you are giving nitroglycerin, if the systolic blood pressure drops more than 10% in a normal tensive, or more than 30% in a hypertensive patient, you want, to, you want to stop giving the nitroglycerin. Also, of course, you want to keep the blood pressure above 90. I always find this funny. The patient should be sitting or lying down when receiving this medication. I wonder who was smart enough to give somebody nitroglycerin while they were standing and then the patient ended up taking a digger. So yeah, just make sure the patient is lit sitting or lying down whenever you give it to them. Now the aerosol itself, the little bottle where you just give the aerosol spray of nitroglycerin, you don't want to shake it up because what it could do is bubbles could get trapped up into the tube that sticks down into the liquid for your spray. And what could happen is it could alter or it could decrease the amount of the meter dose spray. So you don't need to shake it anyway. Those are the precautions for nitroglycerin. 
Morphine is also given in the presence of a heart attack, and the morphine is more given for uh, decreasing the sympathetic response, decreasing the sympathetic stimulus, and also to reduce the pain. It doesn't really directly affect the heart attack itself, but if you give morphine and it reduces the pain, it will also reduce the sympathetic stimulus. If this happens, hopefully what will happen, the heart rate will reduce and the force of contraction. This is the chronotropic And the force of contractions is the inotropic, if you remember those terms. Now, the morphine does not reduce the heart rate. The lack of sympathetic stimulation reduces the heart rate. The morphine does not reduce the force of contractions. The lack of sympathetic stimulation reduces the force of contractions, but the morphine will hopefully begin that whole process. Now, if you reduce the rate and if you reduce the force of contractions, you will result in decreasing the myocardial oxygen demand, which is already overtaxed. Now, the problem with this is you may decrease preload and afterload as well. Is this a bad thing? It could be a bad thing. It's supposed to be a question mark. This could be a bad thing because if the person is already hemodynamically compromised secondary to the myocardial infarction, should you consider giving morphine. So what some systems have done is they've created a set of criteria that says if the patient's blood pressure is, pick your number, do not give nitro, do not give morphine because of course those will potentiate and, uh, or I'm sorry, they will be, there will be a synergistic effect and it will drop the blood pressure even more. But if you can reduce the rate, reduce the contractions, force of contractions, you can reduce the myocardial oxygen demand, you can hopefully prevent a larger infarction area. Beta blockers are beta-1 adrenergic blockers. Of course, beta-1 is one heart. Adrenergic refers to the sympathetic nervous system, so it blocks the sympathetic uh, nervous system receptors right here. And what that does is it reduces the contractile force and the rate, which, of course, chronotropic and inotropic properties. You're decreasing the workload of the heart. What will happen is you can have up to a 13% reduction in mortality just by giving beta blockers and trying to decrease the workload on the heart. Calcium channel blockers can also be given. I've seen more beta blockers given recently than calcium channel blockers. I don't know if there's a research that says that or if it's just preferential treatment for beta blockers rather than calcium channel blockers. But what happens if you give calcium channel blockers, calcium levels are actually reduced in the cell or in the, in the cell. Now, this will reduce the contractile force or the inotropic property. What happens is, if you look over here, this is kind of a review of the sliding filament theory. And if you haven't had the sliding filament theory and you don't understand it, the simple part of this is calcium will bind to this chain right here. And it will expose these little, perp or these little pink heads right here and then this little arm here will reach up and attach and then cause the contraction itself. What happens here is if there's less calcium, less of these binding, these little pink binding sites will open, less of these little heads right here will attach and pull it. So basically what you're doing by reducing the amount of calcium in the muscle, you're decreasing the ability for the muscle to contract really hard. And that's a really simplified version of this. There's a lot of information out there on the internet about the sliding filament theory. If you're interested in looking that up, it's called the sliding filament theory. And I don't know if it's still theoretical or if they've proven it or not, but that's what you want to look up. All right, a fibrinolytic eligibility checklist. I'm just going to talk briefly about this in the event that you ever have to fill one out. That way you're a little bit familiar with it. I have an old one that I use, but they're all kind of sort of the same. Fibrinolytic eligibility checklists can be broken into two different types of criteria. You have inclusionary criteria, which we'll talk about right now. And then there's exclusionary criteria. The inclusionary criteria, if you meet inclusionary criteria
if you meet this criteria, then fibrinolytics can be administered. That means you qualify to receive fibrinolytic medication. This is inclusionary criteria. Here's an example of inclusionary criteria. Is the patient oriented and can the patient cooperate? Is their chest pain consistent? And this is kind of an antiquated term. This is why this is an old checklist that I've had. Um, chest pain or discomfort consistent with AMI. Are the symptoms less than 12 hours old? Is the patient less than 75? And you have specific blood pressure criteria in this one. You have to have a blood pressure that is less than 180 and less than 110. Now, as you go down and check this, you'll say yes, yes, yes. Oh, no, nope, the patient's 80. You'll say no, yes, and yes. If you do this, this means the person does not qualify for medications because the patient is over 75 years of age. Now, does this mean that the patient won't receive it? Absolutely not. You could very easily get the patient to the hospital. A physician or a cardiologist or someone over there could very well do their own eligibility checklist and say, you know what, the patient's 76. We're going to start off with fibrinolytics anyway. So you written, so this is just kind of a... Uh, um, a checklist just to kind of get them out of the way. So let's move on to the exclusionary criteria. Exclusionary criteria means that if this criteria is met, if this criteria is met, fibrinolytics cannot be administered. Now what that means is if they meet this criteria, they do not qualify. Inclusionary means if they meet the criteria, they qualify. Exclusionary means if they meet this criteria, they do not qualify. So let's look at the exclusionary criteria. If a patient has any of these, then the person has, I should be over here, if the patient has any of these and the person cannot receive fibrinolytics. So let's say, and this happened to me one time, I took a patient in and I filled this out. The patient had no history of stroke, no history of brain surgery, no recent trauma within the last two months or any dental visits in the last two months. The patient was not on Coumadin or Warfarin. The patient did not have bleeding problems, no bleeding or GI disease. History, oh, the person did have a history of skin cancer, but it doesn't say that. It just said history of cancer. So I put that and I put skin for skin for a type of cancer it was. No liver problems and, no, and the patient was not pregnant. So technically this right here eliminated the person from being able to receive fibrinolytic therapy. When I got to the hospital I showed the checklist to the physician on, uh, on, at the hospital there in the ER and he looked at it and said skin cancer and I said yes the patient had a carcinoma removed from uh, it was a skin thing that he had removed several years ago and the doctor there said well I'm gonna go ahead and do fibrinolytics anyway and went ahead and went with fibrinolytics even though the person had a history of cancer so like I said you could get there and they could change their decision and say well let's go ahead and do it anyway kind of thing just to prevent the patient from potentially going to surgery that is the fibrinolytic eligibility checklist. Now I'm going to briefly talk about the fibrinolytics. I'm not going to get really specific here. I used to, but I'm not going to get crazy with it. So the one thing that you need to know about fibrinolytics, and this is the critical thing that you should know at the entry level into something like this, is that fibrin are the threads as it were, that holds the clot together, the fibrin threads. Okay, Now, these fibrin threads can be broken down by a substance called plasmin. In the body, there is free-floating plasminogen that when converted, this proenzyme right here is converted into plasmin. Now the plasmin is the enzyme 
that will break apart these threads, these fibrin threads, which actually break apart, breaks apart the clot itself. So the focus here is converting plasminogen into plasmin. And each one of these medications will do that in one way or another. So I'm just going to go through this briefly. There's stuff on your handout if you want to read up on it a little bit more thoroughly. You're more than welcome to. I'm not going to get heavy into the dosages because really unless you're going to be administering these things, it's kind of the dosages will just seem like a bunch of numbers. So streptokinase is also abbreviated as or also known as SK or streptase. Um, it says it has a bacterial origin. There's a product called hemolytic streptococci. Streptococci is a, is a particular type of, of bacteria and the reason that this comes from the bacteria with this particular bacterium is because the it's called a virulent factor and the bacterium will release this enzyme that actually causes clotting to be prevented so that way it can replicate itself and continue to spread in the body basically. So they took this and they worked with it and they actually came up with the streptokinase. What it does is it combines with plasminogen to create an activator complex, which then catalyzes uh, plasminogen and changes it to plasmin. So like I said, plasmin is the enzyme that, uh, that attaches to the fibrin protein chains and then breaks apart the clot. So what happens is they give the streptokinase and it gets in there. It the pla it converts the plasminogen into plasmin and then it starts breaking apart clots. APSAC or an anisoylated plasminogen streptokinase activator complex converts circulating and trapped plasminogen. Now what this means, circulating and trapped plasminogen, is that when the clot is built and you, you actually have all of these fibrin threads right here that build up the clot that hold the tissue together to be rebuilt also will trap things like uh, plasminogen and it will also trap fibrinogen and some other stuff. So things get trapped in these fibrin threads like a web. So what happens is this APSAC here will convert trapped plasminogen into plasmin. It is a form of streptokinase and it does have a longer half-life. Because remember what happens when you start breaking apart this clot, you start releasing all of these little factors in here. And if there are clotting factors in here, this could start to re-clot again, which of course you don't want it to do. Another fibrinolytic is called urokinase. Originally de derived from the proteins found in urine, but they're also found in blood, so don't think that people are injecting urine into the body. Lower incidence of reactions with urokinase. TPA is a common one. It's called tissue plasminogen activator. It will bind to the fibrin threads and convert trapped plasminogen. Like I said, sometimes you will trap plasminogen, convert trapped plasminogen into plasmin. The nice thing about this is this plasmin is now also located within that clot, so it can very quickly and effectively break apart the clot itself. This is TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator. Another... Uh, type of tissue plasminogen activator, something called alteplase. This is something called a recombinant form, which means it has different DNA forms of the protein to initiate the tissue plasminogen activator. Half-life of five minutes. It's usually inf infused over an hour. Very short half-life, so you have to be very careful about that paradoxical procoagulability. Retivase or ret retiplase is uh, very similar to alteplase, but it has a longer half-life, 15 minutes. Fortunately, this or unfortunately, this cannot be given in the same line with, with heparin. Tenecteplase is another one, also called TNK or TNKase or whatever. Um, this is designed to better resist plasminogen activation inhibitor. Now, it's going to, the tissue plasminogen is going to be breaking down, and when it becomes plasmin, it's going to be breaking down those fibrin threads. The problem is you have to stop that breakdown. You have to prevent plasminogen from continuously converting into plasmin forever. 
So there's an inhibitor that stops the process from converting plasminogen into plasmin. Uh, being used, when I wrote this, it was still being studied. I don't know if it is being used all that much, but uh, very short onset and half-life. So the big thing about fibrinolytics you want to consider is that as you give these fibrinolytics, as these, or as they are administered actually, there is a huge chance of somebody actually having something called reperfusion dysrhythmias. There's a huge problem with something like this. Now what happens is as you break apart the clot, the blood vessel will open up and what will happen is the blood will start flowing into the area that was ischemic and it will start washing out all of the byproducts, all the lactic acids, it will start washing out all of the carbon dioxide, it'll start washing everything out. What that does is it starts re-nutrienting re or starting to give more nutrients, I guess, to the areas that have been ischemic. Now because these areas have been ischemic they become very irritable enzymes I'm sorry electrolytes get on the other side of the cell membrane and they're not supposed to be there the cell loses its efficiency and it becomes very irritable as the body or in this case as the area becomes washed out and old stuff is taken away and new stuff is brought in the irritability now has the nutrients to show off the irritability and they start throwing PVCs or runs of VTAC or something along those lines. Now this will only happen for a little while. Those are just considered reperfusion dysrhythmias. What you do not want to do is start treating reperfusion dysrhythmias. You want to give them a few minutes, as long as they're hemodynamically stable, give them a few minutes to see if the reperfusion dysrhythmias disappear as the, as the area is reperfused. Make sure, though, that you treat the patient. Always make sure you treat the patient. So just remember, reperfusion dysrhythmias are possible with fibrinolytics. Some other modalities, I'm going to touch on these briefly. The PCI is a percutaneous coronary intervention. There are a lot of really cool videos on the internet, be it uh, YouTube or Bing videos, wherever you want to go. There's a lot of really good videos about percutaneous coronary interventions where they have physicians, cardiologists going through and performing them, and they will talk through them, and they will discuss what's going on with the artery and how they inflate the balloons and the drug eluding stents. I mean, they're really, really neat. So, And the videos are usually somewhere between 5 and 12 minutes long. They're not that long, and they're very informative and very fun to watch. But percutaneous coronary interventions, there are about 50,000 patients in the U.S. get PCIs every year. I'm betting that number has gone up since I wrote this presentation. Uh, PTCA is percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. That's the one where a lot of people have that one. And there's also coronary arthrectomy and intracoronary stenting, a couple different ones out there. PTCA is usually indicated if the symptoms are less than 12 hours old. Hopefully this right here looks familiar because if you remember on that fibrinolytic eligibility checklist, one of the inclusionary criteria was is the patient having symptoms that are less than 12 hours years old, 12 hours old. Exclusionary, the patient had symptoms occurring longer than 12 hours. Usually an angiogram is performed to determine if angioplasty is needed. And that's whenever they go in and they shoot the uh, radioactive dye, the iodine dye, into the, um, into the coronary artery. And they check to see if, it, it, if, you, if they can see the tree. It's called the tree of the coronary blood vessels. If they can't, then that's where they need to go in there and see if they can get the clot removed or at least smashed up against the sides of the wall. Um, if angioplasty is needed, now that's the angiogram, just shooting the iodine to see if, it's, if they can still see the clot. The angioplasty is when they go in and they do the balloon and or the stent. For the angioplasty, a wire is usually inserted, and like I said, there's some really cool videos out there on the internet, so this would probably be a great time uh, whenever you, after the video to go and just, just look up a couple of them just to see if it really 
what really happens and stuff. The catheter is removed, leaving a wire to thread the balloon. The balloon is inflated, compressing the plaque within the artery. It's not inflated very much. I mean, you don't want to blow out the artery, so it's just inflated, inflated very just a little bit. And then the balloon is deflated and then removed. And then in some cases, what will happen is they will reinsert a stent. Now, a drug-eluting stent is a, is a stent that actually decreases the inflammation of the blood vessel wall and it promotes the endothelial lining, remodeling onto the stent itself. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to drug-eluting stents. The problem with the drug-eluting stent is that a lot of times the people have to be on blood thinners a lot longer uh, to try to prevent the reocclusion of everything from happening. Uh, people who have not had stents put in in the past or who have had non-drug eluting stents put in, the remodeling goes really well. The problem is it goes too well, and they can reocclude very quickly and very easily. So there's some advantages and disadvantages to both of them. Coronary arthrectomy is whenever the, uh, the plaque is removed rather than compressed. Usually what happens is they have to go past the plaque itself. They have to be able to get past it and inflate a balloon on either side so they can go in and dig it out without any kind of um, debris or anything going distally down into the subendocardial plexus at all. There is a higher incidence of complications, but the restenosis rate is about the same as a PTCA. That's a coronary arthrectomy. Some other PCIs that are out there, there's something called an angiojet thrombectomy. This uses high-velocity saline on an unorganized clot just to break it up, and then they can get it out of there. They can, like, suck it out of there. So the coronary laser angioplasty is when a laser energy is used to remove obstructions by breaking up the molecular bonds. Um, and then there's radiation PCI ther brachytherapy, which is, treats the instant restenosis by radiotherapy of a coronary vessel wall, PTCA is used to reopen the lesion and then radioactive resources on the tip of a catheter are run across the lesion itself. I'm not really sure how many times these are actually used, but these are some of the other percutaneous coronary interventions that are actually out there right now. Bottom line about treating these people is that rapid assessment intervention is paramount to increase the survivability of a patient experiencing acute coronary syndromes. Once again, if you're suspecting the person might be having a heart attack, just treat them as a heart attack because it's better to be told, oh, the person wasn't having a heart attack rather than why didn't you treat the heart attack. Remember, 50% of the people who have heart attack symptoms of acute coronary syndromes do not present with typical MI symptoms. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and if you do have any questions, please feel free to contact your lecture instructor.